Hello everyone, Loremaster Sotek here, back with another prediction video, but this time we're going from patch 4.0 to patch 5.0. So we are jumping from the Shadows of Change and all of the Zinchian goodness to the Thrones of Decay, which is the Nurgle themed DLC that also features the Empire and the Dwarfs. So. This video should not be as long as the last one because I feel like for the last one, I spent a lot of time kind of <laughs> like laying the groundwork. So uh, make sure you watch that video before you watch this one uh, because I'm not going to focus on a lot of the things I already touched on there. So we're just going to jump straight into what is basically showed on the Steam page for 5.0 and see if we can maybe suss out some details because there are some very slight hints. So... First, we're going to start with what is coming in patch 5.0. Uh, we do know that there are going to be race updates, uh, legacy and otherwise, for Nurgle, the Empire, and Dwarfs. This is very exciting information. Uh, the three of them, I think, definitely need some love and care. Uh, Nurgle in particular, especially Monogod Nurgle, um, like I think Festus is probably fine, but uh, Kugoth is... Yeah, uh, the, the Nurgle tech tree was designed very bizarrely um, in that I, I understand why they did what they did, where they kind of, they pigeonholed it too hard, where Kugat's tech tree was very heavily designed explicitly around his start position in the Realm of Chaos campaign, which was not a great decision in retrospect. Um, obviously, you want to have... Um, much more broad tech trees because if anything changes such as your start position all of a sudden your tech tree sucks and that is the case for kugoth is that his tech tree does not make any sense in immortal empires a significant amount of it is dedicated to specific terrain types that he is nowhere near granted it's not as bad now as it was because at least now in immortal empires you can sail up to the river ruin and take the sea lane that takes you all the way up uh, into the, uh, I think it's the Sea of Claws. Um, and with that, you're able to um, set up in, you know, a proper situation. But um, when it comes to... So I really hope they're going to fix that, make the Nurgle tree uh, a lot better um, and just a lot more broad. Uh, you, you really need to get rid of the techs or very heavily revamp the techs that are designed around specific terrain types. Uh, that should not be a feature uh, because it, it it's too restrictive. Uh, it causes too many problems. So with that in mind, um, that's kind of the big thing I'm expecting with Nurgle. I also would really like to see them introduce a way for Nurgle to reliably get walls. Uh, I still feel very strongly that Nurgle should have the Bretonia treatment where if a minor settlement reaches level three, it basically turns into like a nice, like it, it gets solid garrisoned um, as opposed to being like all the other races that actually require garrison buildings. Granted, I feel like I could do a video just talking about garrisons because the garrisons are obviously trash right now in Total War Warhammer 3. They are super terrible and need some pretty serious revamps, but that's neither here nor there. Um, as far as like the rest of Nurgle stuff, goes uh, i think nurgle's honestly like fine it's, it still has a lot of really cool things they just need to um you know make various edits where they need to uh to just keep things moving nicely but uh i am very very excited uh, for the future of nurgle as far as the the empire goes when looking at reworks uh i still feel that the empire could have its tech tree further expanded they have a grossly simplified tech tree uh, it is probably one of the simplest in the game it's not a bad tech tree it's just very very small uh which is weird for a culture that's as like developed as the empire. So I would love to see them uh, flesh it out significantly more than it currently is. I think you could add like at least 10 or 20 techs uh, and uh, that would help a lot uh, to just kind of further allow for longer term play, um, especially when looking at immortal empires. But uh, the big thing for me is Balthazar Gelt. Um, the longer we've kind of gone with the empire initially when they released the electric count system, it was great, uh, where you like, you know, you pick your own little electric counts and do all this stuff, but 
it it kind of feels weird now where the only two characters that still play with the electric count system are Carl Franz and Balthazar Gelt. And Gelt really doesn't feel like he should be involved with it. Uh, I personally feel that Gelt would make a lot more sense if he had his own unique Colleges of Magic system that is similar to the Electric Count system, but is about him trying to gather the colleges together and unify them under himself as the Grand uh, or the Supreme Patriarch. Uh, like, let Carl Franz have the electric count system. I think that suits him very, very nicely. Um, I still think it would be, I still think uh, it should also be kind of vaguely opened up to Vlad von Karstein. Uh, that way, there's one other character that participates in it, and you kind of have a versus system of Vlad, you know, the, the vampire emperor versus Carl Franz, the true emperor. Uh, and that allows for some really interesting play. Also, if they one day please. Hopefully, give us a playable Boris Toddbringer. I think Boris Toddbringer should also be able to use that system as well. Uh, that would just make sense. So that would be like a really nice little selection of characters. Um, however, uh, for Balthazar Gelp, I really think it should be the Colleges of Magic. Um, granted, I think that is very reliant on what comes in this DLC. Uh, we need Wizard Lords. We need Wizard Lords. But we'll get to that when we get to the proper prediction uh, portion as far as... Uh, like new units and stuff, but I really think that's all the empire really needs as far as like rework stuff goes. And then uh, last, but certainly not least the dwarfs, uh, the dwarfs are doing pretty well. Uh, I think continuing to expand on the runic system is good. Like the dwarfs honestly feel in a pretty good place for me right now. I really like being able to forge items, be able to forge runes, uh, break items down. I think for dwarves, I would really like to see more effort done on sieges, uh, making siege warfare for dwarves feel, uh, maybe a bit more unique, um, and a bit more like dwarves are kind of the true masters of defending themselves. I also think there could be some fun stuff done as far as maybe focusing on the underway. Um, the, uh, the roads that go underneath the ground and connect the various holds, maybe playing into that somehow by like allowing you, if you establish like um, defensive or military alliance with other dwarf holds or you own those other dwarf holds, maybe being able to like have a campaign feature that revolves around like, you know, clearing the underway between them. So like that maybe if they had like a much more selective, not caravan system, but something kind of similar where you could be like sending out like groups that clear those paths. And if you eventually get them all the way opened up, uh, maybe that allows you to get like significant, uh, buffs, uh, like permanent buffs as when you establish those routes open, you become uh, better defended against sieges, M more materials are flowing between them. So like, Hey, if you establish that opening with Karakazul, uh, you have permanent buffs to all of your melee infantry units because they have access to Karakazul uh, iron iron smithing and iron working uh, and runic weapons. But if you get like that trade route open or an under uh, underway route open with Zuffbar, you get significant buffs to your black powder units. Uh, and your war machine, stuff like that. Though I will say, I think for me, the biggest thing I want with the dwarves is more landmark buildings. Um, of all the races in the game with landmarks, the dwarves to me feel like the most lacking. Every major hold should have a landmark building. And the fact they haven't done that is pretty, pretty disappointing, frankly. And it's something that I think needs to be addressed and should not be hard to address. Um, Zuffbar, Barakvar, uh, Kedakirn, Kedaknorn, um, and, uh, I, I think the rest of them, uh, I, I, I want to say Karakazul has one, but I'm not hundred percent sure, but like every major hold should absolutely have a dwarf landmark building. The dwarves should revolve around the concept of reclaiming all of the major holds and reestablishing the Karazan core. I would probably even go so far as to say that um, um, Red Eye Mountain should have one as well as, um, oh gosh, brain fart, uh, 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 Black Crag. Um, maybe Ekrand as well. Uh, yeah, definitely Ekrand as well. But like dwarves, you should be very heavily rewarded for conquering the Karazankor. Um, but uh, I think the tech tree is great. I don't like 
I don't really think it needs to be expanded. Uh, it's plenty big. Like just continue like making sure all the techs are worth it. Uh, but other than that, I think they're in a really good place. Um, you know, maybe add some more runic items. Uh, okay. So, uh, we also have the nemesis crown. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it really. Uh, I have a video you can go watch that I'll link to down below where I go all out on the nemesis crown and talk about it for like 20 or 30 minutes, uh, about how like maybe it could be implemented the history behind it and all this stuff. Uh, I will say that I'm extremely excited for the nemesis crown. That's probably the most exciting announcement, um, for me personally, because it's just another sort of cane type item but this one will be located in the old world. Uh, I will say this kind of makes me really hope we will get an Eastern super item as well. So either a super item somewhere around like end Koresh, Cathay, Nippon type area. Um, I don't, I don't know what it could be. Um, there is a insane amount of like God tier relics, uh, contained within the histories and mythologies of like, Southeast Asia, China, and Japan and Korea and stuff. So like, there's plenty to work with. Um, you just pick one of those items and adapt it into Warhammer Fantasy, and it would be quite easy to do, I think. Uh, it's just a matter of picking one. That's the hard part. Um, so let's get to the uh, actual predictions. We'll start with the free LC. So the, the free LC hero says, uh, another legendary hero joins the toolbox, which is the hint. Uh, this is a dwarf. It's, it, I, I say without even the slightest of hesitation, it is a dwarf. Um, when looking at Nurgle, the empire and dwarfs toolbox engineer, someone that works with tools, there is nobody besides the dwarfs that really has earned that, uh, the empire does have engineer heroes, but they don't have any really famous ones. There's no engineer special character. Um, and there's no living engineers who are like particularly famous. Um, like there are a couple of notable guys, but no one that's ever been even close to playable. Whereas the dwarfs, um, when thinking about toolbox, we have Grim Burlickson. Uh, Grim Burlickson is the, uh, he's functionally the master uh, engineer special character. He is the son of, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on D Damon Burlickson. I can't, I can't remember his first name, but, uh, uh, um, D uh, or Burlick Damonson, something like that. I, I can't remember his name at the top of my head, uh, but he's actually uh, a character mentioned in the older dwarf books. Um, uh, so Grim Burlickson is a badass. He is a younger dwarf. Uh, some would say a beardling who has joined the engineers guild in Zuffbar, And he is not, he is not a dwarf held back by convention. He is a dwarf that is pushing the envelope, coming up with wild new inventions and really kind of like doing everything in his power to take engineering to the next level to the point that he has designed a new gun being the grudge raker, uh, which has been interpreted in several different ways. Um, it's true like tabletop form. The grudge raker is basically a double barreled rifle, um, that is very, very accurate. So it it's just, but it's basically like a, a thunderer's rifle gun that, uh, can shoot extremely high piercing rounds. Um, that, and it, it carries two, sh it, it fires twice, um, in a volley essentially. Uh, Vermintide reinterpreted it into a shotgun, um, which is not what it really is, but, uh, like, eh, whatever. Uh, you could also argue that like the same could be said for iron drakes, uh, in tabletop iron drakes, very explicitly fired out like, like bolts of alchemical flame. They were not flamethrowers. Uh, but in Total War and Vermintide, the Iron Drakes were reinterpreted to be flamethrowers, whereas Drake fire pistols shoot the classic alchemical bolt mixture. Uh, so it could be that they remake it into a shotgun. Um, there's really no, it's not a huge deal, honestly, as long as it performs well, who cares, right? Um, but the other stuff that Grim Burlickson have has, uh, he also has a, um, a steam powered, uh, like mechanical gauntlet that wraps around, uh, his arm and it gives him a significant amount of bonus strength. Uh, it makes him quite nasty in melee and he wields a cog ax. Uh, so he has, he has a steam, uh, the, the steam also goes into his ax, uh, that allows him to wield it with a profound amount of strength. And it's designed with kind of a peculiar, almost gear like shape that allows him to catch people's weapons in it. And then using the steam power, he 
like jerks his weapon and it snaps people's weapons in half and stuff like that. So he breaks their weapons. Uh, but he's a very, very badass character should provide a lot of buffs to various shooting units or war machines that are nearby. I think he'll make a fantastic legendary hero. I would be shocked if it's not Grim Berlickson. Um, to me, that feels like such an obvious pick. Uh, the only other character it could be, in my opinion, is Malachi Mackison, who I talked about um, yesterday a little bit as far as like the free hero we're going to be getting at the end of this month being May. Um, uh, Malachi Mackison is also a famous engineer dwarf, um, though he is also a slayer. Uh, so he's like the big slayer dwarf. Um, Malachi Mackison is a bit of a weird character. Um, like I, I think he do fine as legendary hero. He's very on par with like go Trek Felix and Ulrika. So as, as far as like just a free LC bonus, he would make a lot of sense to be honest. Um, so it could be, it's either Grimm or Malachi, but it's, it's one of the two. I, I think that's beyond question. Um, so getting into the actual DLC itself, since I'm already talking about dwarfs, let's start with the dwarfs. So for the dwarfs, uh, I feel very strongly the dwarfs have two solid DLCs worth of content missing. Uh, so there's a lot of things that could be in this DLC, um, because I honestly think the dwarfs need this and one more. So assuming because we're getting an engineering character that it is an engineer themed DLC, um, I would sell my soul for an engineer character Lord. And for that, I would like to get like a guild, uh, an engineer, gu engineers, guild master or guild master engineer, however you want to phrase it. Uh, but the engineers guild has like these really big, badass engineers who are like the proper, like masters of the craft. And I think they would make excellent lord choices. Uh, giving the dwarfs like a lord who maybe wields some kind of gun, like maybe they have a pistol in one hand and like some kind of axe or hammer um, in the other hand, or they wield uh, maybe like a Drake fire pistol, so they shoot like a bolt of fire or something. But I I really think we need more melee shooting hybrid lords because they're just they're such a unique dynamic um, that we don't get to see as much. Um, I also think this would be a great opportunity to finally uh, get dwarfs with big scary mounts in that if we have the guildsmith engineer, uh, we would allow him and the regular engineer to take a gyrocopter mount uh, so they could ride a copter and either have the steam gun or the brimstone gun, uh, maybe like at like like at the lowest level, they get a steam gun. And then if they upgrade it, they can go to a brimstone gun. Uh, and then if they get to a high enough level, they can go all the way up to a gyro bomber. Um, and for the master engineer hero, I would stop at the gyro bomber. Like that's as high as he could go. Um, but for the, um, the guild master engineer, I would say that he could go all the way up to a thunder barge. Um, and the Thunder Barge would also be a new unit that I would introduce. So the Thunder Barge would be a, um, you know, a giant Zeppelin sized, uh, warship that really brings the hurt. Like Cathayans have their cute little, you know, their, their cute little air balloons, uh, hot air balloons with, uh, with some uh, like guns and stuff and like a front mounted um, missiles, but they're not very good at defending themselves in the air. Whereas a dwarf thunder barge, these things were made to take on dragons. Like they are serious, serious war machines flying up in the air. Um, the, the, uh, the one that we saw in eighth edition Warhammer fantasy had organ guns on it. So like it had organ gun batteries and it could drop bombs, uh, like big bombs. So I would love for them to have like a really, really powerful drop bomb that they could drop like one to three times, depending on how strong it is, uh, have organ gun batteries so that they're able to like do kind of like strafing runs where they're firing down at, uh, infantry on the ground or, or like shooting at enemy flyers. I also think they should have like some kind of built in effect or ability where, where enemy flyers are attacking them. They like, maybe they have, 
of uh, like they throw out like little bombs into the air, like little scattershot bombs that uh, deal damage to enemy units um, that are in, it only works on flyers. So like it's kind of like a direct damage ability as they're like throwing out these explosives that slows enemy flyers and deals damage or lowers their melee attack, allowing the Thunder Barge time to like retreat to a better position. Um, but they, they should be dangerous to enemy flyers. Like a thunder bar should have like a pretty serious threat range. And granted, if you can get like big monsters on it, yeah, they should be able to beat it reliably. Um, but like a unit of harpy should not be able to take down a thunder barge. A unit of harpy should get absolutely annihilated. And maybe another way to help with that would be like the little dwarfs on board, um, have thunderers or pistol wielders who are constantly, uh, like they have infinite ammo and they just shoot a little bit kind of like how um, I think the uh, I want to say it's the Bastilladons. I think the javelin throwers have infinite ammo. Um, I don't know if they have infinite ammo, but they have a ton that's separate from the regular um, ammo uh, of the artillery piece. And I would do the same thing for the Thunder Barge where you have little dwarfs on it who can shoot at nearby units with guns, but the organ guns are the, uh, or whatever guns, they, the war machine guns they have on them are like, bum, 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 bum. that's where the actual ammo is. But they should be serious threats um, and provide all sorts of like fun buffs and stuff. But that should be, that has to be the big unit the dwarfs get the thunder barge, I think has been like the most requested big, bad unit that we have yet to see in the game. Um, as far as what's beyond that, if it's going to be engineering themed, um, if, if we're going to get a new hero, I would really like to see the rune priestess of Valea. Um, I think the rune priestess would be an amazing opportunity. We would finally get a lady dwarf in the game. She could provide healing. Uh, she could provide all sorts of like fun little buffs. Um, as she, cause the rune priestess, uh, rune priests slash rune priestesses use very different rune magic from a rune smith. Rune smiths are, um, you know, they are smiths that take the winds of magic and forge them into runes. And then if they go into the battlefields, they're able to take runes that have magic, uh, built into them and unleash and like they take the winds of magic that are swirling around the battlefield, put it into the rune and then strike it. And it unleashes the magic in a uh, particular form, which is what like the actual rune spells you're seeing are rune priests, uh, tend to carry staves or staffs that have runes already pre carved into them and are constantly gathering in the winds of magic. And they unleash these, uh, by, you know, calling out certain words or slamming into the ground or whatever. And they unleash very different kinds of runes. Um, we actually see a rune priest in the scar snake novel, uh, who uses healing powers. Uh, he is able to channel magic through his rune staff and he uses it to literally heal dwarfs that are dying, um, and restore them to good health. Uh, he's able to use it to like blow apart a wall and some other stuff. So having a rune priestess who's more of a support character, um, but she's more about like warding and healing as opposed to like combat buffs with, we see with the regular runesmiths, I think would be excellent. Um, and it would provide dwarfs with like a regular healer without having to always call upon Felix. So I think this should, a rune priestess should be more designed around like unit healing, uh, not as much character healing, but however they interpret it, it'd be fine. Um, I don't think it'd be that overpowered, um, uh, as long as the price for her is decent, but I think she could have some very, very cool powers. Uh, and it would just be cool to see a lady dwarf on the battlefield. Um, Back to uh, units. I talked about the Thunder Barge um, with engineering. Uh, I also think miners with steam drills would be really cool. Uh, steam drills are said to be these like really powerful uh, two-handed weapons that are used to cleave through like just the hardest of rock. Uh, I kind of envisage them as something sort of similar to the Skaven warp grinders. Um, where like they, except for, uh, instead of it being two Skaven carrying around, uh, a, a, a drill together as a weapon team, you have individual dwarves carrying these large drills, uh, probably kind of like, um, I, I'm not sure exactly what they would look like. I don't, I don't even remember if we ever had a tabletop model for them. Uh, hopefully <laughs> maybe, maybe the editor or a, a skeleton can edit a image up if he finds an image of one, but, uh, they were significantly powerful. Uh, they counted as great weapons and were, a little stronger still. Um, also steam drills allowed miners to have some really fun deployment rules. So I think it'd be nice for the steam drill to grant Vanguard to the unit that has it, but maybe also they have like stock, uh, at the beginning of the battle, 
but it only lasts for like 30 seconds or until the enemy sees them for the first time and then it goes away forever. So like they have a unique form of stock that re represents them burrowing beneath the ground and beneath the rock and they come up somewhere on the battlefield and the enemy doesn't know they're there yet until they're revealed because that could actually allow dwarfs to have a melee uh, stealth Vanguard unit, which would be very unique for them because the dwarves don't have anything like that right now. Uh, and I, I don't think that would be too bad at all. You know, they still be infantry, so it's not like they'd be super fast, but it could allow for some really interesting shenanigans for dwarf players that they normally don't have access to. Uh, the next thing for engineering is the Goblin Hewer. So the Goblin Hewer is a new war machine. Uh, it is the best way I could describe it is imagine an escalator, you know, like those little stairs that you go up. Um, but moving really, really fast, like a treadmill or a treadmill is a better term, actually a treadmill that's moving really fast. And it has all these little like arm attachments that have dwarf throwing axes. So like it moves so fast that it's hurling just tons of these dwarven throwing axes at enemies in front of it. And it's called the goblin hewer because it shot so many munitions at such a deadly speed that it would just obliterate ranks of goblins. I have actually been on the receiving end of a goblin hewer in tabletop. And, uh, I will tell you it was, it was brutal. Uh, my giant unit of temple guard got eviscerated by that piece of garbage because the bigger the unit was, the more damage it did. And I had a huge unit of temple guard. Um, and it, it was very painful, but, uh, should be like, it should probably be the shortest range weapon, uh, maybe like kind of on par or a little shorter than the flame cannon. And these should be very heavy armor piercing missiles. So like intense armor piercing, very fast rate of fire. Um, probably not the best like um, uh, aim radius, like probably a bit more narrow than most war machines uh, and a lesser range, but they should probably have kind of like an arcing fire. And if you get hit by it, it should like rip you to pieces. Um, I, I think it would be very, very hilarious to see, especially because since it's a Malachi Mackison weapon, it traditionally has a slayer crew, not a regular crew, uh, which could make it a bit interesting. Uh, if it, stayed that way uh because if it has a slayer crew that means they'd be unbreakable and they'd also would have um surprisingly better melee stats so they would be they would be a bit more durable when it came to fending off um units that traditionally take out war machines like harpies or um warhounds and stuff like that i still don't think they would be able to survive against a full unit by any means of the imagination but they would be able to hold out a little longer um, than other units that would break and run or just get absolutely massacred. Uh, so that could be a lot of fun. Uh, so that would be, that would be my three. Uh, and then Lord and hero for the legendary Lord. I feel like it's going to be Joseph Buckman. Um, if Grim Berlickson ends up becoming a legendary hero, then Joseph Bookman has to be the legendary Lord. Uh, Bookman, uh, brings a lot of really awesome, uh, awesome themes, to the dwarves, he's a ranger, uh, so he's not he's as far away from kind of a traditional dwarf king as you can get, uh, where he's got his axe old, old, old trustworthy, I think it's called, and like his his keg of bugmans as he just goes goes to town on people. Uh, he fights with and he's got a crossbow as well, so he would be a legendary lord with shooting attacks. Uh, and then when he gets into melee, he puts out his pulls out his big axes, just starts hewing through people. He would have a lot of stealth elements being a, a ranger character. He would be very, very different from all of the other dwarf legendary Lords we have so far. Um, I think Bugman would provide a, a, a very nice mix of as much as I would love to have Grim Berlickson as just a engineer legendary Lord. Um, the engineers guild, um, has never really had a traditional Lord choice. Um, and uh, Bugman uh, is known for kind of leading his own little armies around. So it would make sense to see him, to be honest. Uh, but I, I think that would be a ton of fun. Um, but like, you know, if they came out and did Grim Berlickson as the lore, legendary lord and then Malachi Makasin as legendary hero, I'd be thrilled. If they did Bugman as the lord and Grim Berlickson as the hero, still thrilled. If they did Bugman as the legendary lord and Malachi Makasin as the legendary hero, still thrilled. My only thing is Malachi Makasin cannot be a legendary lord. As far as I'm concerned, I hate the idea of him being a legendary Lord. He does not lead armies. No dwarf in their right mind would ever, ever follow Malachi Moccasin into battle. 
Um, he is a he is an outcast engineer slayer. He is as he is as disgraced in dwarven culture as you possibly can be. The only reason Ungrim is able to lead armies is because he is a king. He is not a tr he's not like a true traditional slayer. You know, Ungrim has inherited his shame from others. Um, there is no fucking way in a million years any dwarf would ever follow Malachi Makasin as a general into battle. Um, he should not be anywhere close to a Lord or legendary Lord slot. That, that is, it's too far. That's like beyond the pale. As far as I'm concerned, um, that it would be, uh, it would just be ridiculous. Um, like it's just not dwarfs. Like you, if you're going to do that, you might as well come out with dwarf cavalry models at that point, because you're just like, you're just taking such a big crap on what dwarf lore is. Uh, you, you cannot, you just cannot have, um, Malachi Makasin as a legendary Lord. I understand that he's a cool character, but he doesn't fit the role and no dwarf would ever follow him. Slayers wouldn't follow him. Um, cause he's like, he's so unconventional and he just doesn't take his Slayer seriously at all. Um, he's just off doing his own stuff. Um, I think he can work absolutely as a legendary hero. I think he could even work as a regiment of renown. Um, where you just have the spirit of Grugni, his thunder barge, um, or his little, his, uh, Zeppelin thing. And it's just the regiment of renowned version of the thunder barge. And it's just that it's Malachi Makachin's ship and he's in it. But like, that's the representation he gets. I would still be fine with that. Um, but he should not be a Lord under any circumstances. I, I think that would be a travesty. Um, and just a huge, not cool thing to do from a, like, like, I realize a lot of people are like, eh, lore, but like, there's, there's a couple lines you shouldn't cross. And I think that's a line you shouldn't cross. Um, uh, as far, so beyond the dwarfs, uh, we also have the umpire. So thrones of decay, uh, maybe Nurgle being next would make more sense. Uh, thrones of decay, uh, tells us a lot. Um, in my opinion, it could mean two different things. Really thrones of decay to me feels like it is referencing the throne of chaos, which the throne of chaos is the main catalyst that the Tarmacon event revolves around. Uh, the Tarmacon storyline from forge world revolves around this prophecy that there are four brothers who were the sons of the great Kurgan and the great Kurgan was said to be one of the greatest warlords that ever lived of chaos. And he went on to dominate uh, a large swath of uh, parts of the world um, but in order to do so, he made a bargain with the dark gods and the dark gods told him that in, in exchange for their, their power and their service, he would eventually have to give up, uh, his, um, his children. So he ended up having four children, uh, four sons, um, that were, uh, quadruplets and, um, the, uh, the dark gods, the, their due, uh, the, the time came to pay his due and a great wind came in and stole his four children and scattered them to the, uh, the, the, the four gods and the great Kurgan, uh, fell into despair and was never heard from again after he lost his children. Um, and he fell. Um, <laughs> so one of those children is Tarmacon. We never learned about the other three. Um, Forge world was supposed to publish three more books and they didn't because the series got canceled. Um, but Tarmacon is the Nurgle child and the only one we really know anything about. Um, Tarmacon, um, the, the thing about the prophecy was it was said that the four brothers would wage their own conquests in search of something known as the throne of chaos. And that, uh, one of them, uh, potentially would claim this throne and it would allow them to ascend to the highest of forms of power. Um, so Tarmacon, uh, heard a version of the prophecy that told that he would go to the city of Nuln, And if he successfully destroyed the city of Nuln and, um, offered it up to Nurgle as a sacrifice, murdered all of its people, drowned the city in filth and, uh, claimed it as his own throne that he would, uh, complete the prophecy and ascend. So Tarmacon goes on to wage this giant war. Uh, inevitably he fails and is killed. 
Uh, but a lot of people love the Tarmacon story because, frankly, it's a fantastic book. It was not balanced at all. It was horribly balanced, but the lore was really cool and the models were really cool. And that's really all that matters. So uh, because it's called Thrones of Decay, frankly, I think it's Tarmacon. Uh, I, I would be shocked if it's not Tarmacon. The only other character who I think it could reasonably be is uh, Epidemius, um, the, the tallyman of Nurgle, um, the uh, master tallyman. So uh, Tarmacon, though, big, he's a big boy. Uh, Tarmacon is a very, very powerful warrior. He might be, a, he, he's going to be a little weird to implement because there are two different versions of him. There's one, uh, Tarmacon himself is actually a maggot. Um, like he, he has been so heavily mutated by Nurgle's gifts that he has turned into this disgusting man sized maggot thing, which is why he's called the maggot Lord. Um, and what he does is he basically puppets the bodies of others from inside of them. So whenever someone destroys the body that he is currently inhabiting, um, by like, they think they killed him, but they didn't, they just destroyed the body. Uh, the maggot form, which is his true form comes erupting out of it and will attack the person that killed him, uh, destroyed his main body and he'll eat his way inside of them through their neck. Uh, and if he succeeds, he takes over their body and uses them as a new puppet and he acquires all of their strengths. So over the course of Tarmacon's story, we see him go from being inside the body of a chaos champion. Who's just a man. Um, eventually that body is destroyed by an ogre tyrant, but Tarmacon successfully, um, kills the ogre tyrant by leaping out of his old body. He eats his way into the ogre tyrant's body and takes that body over and he ends up becoming significantly more powerful. Uh, though eventually that dooms him because he becomes so fond of the ogre body strength that he doesn't abandon it when he should have. So the body starts to degrade and that ends up leading to his death, uh, because he didn't have as strong as a body as he may have had if he had continued switching. Um, that being said, I suspect he will show up in both forms somehow. Uh, maybe there will be some kind of toggle you're able to select on the campaign map where you can decide whether he's in a human body or an ogre body. Uh, and depending on which body you go in, he gets different buffs and debuffs. So like if he's in the human size body, he counts as small. Uh, maybe he's faster or maybe he has like better, uh, melee stats, uh, as far as like melee defense and like avoiding damage is concerned. He's also obviously not going to be vulnerable to anti-large stuff. He's less of a target for shooting. Um, but if you put him in the ogre body, like he's a bigger target, he hits harder, maybe his like, but a lot of his like, uh, like melee defense and melee attack might not be as high. Uh, but he has like significantly higher weapon strength. He has higher movement. Um, so, you know, have trade-offs. He also has a mount, uh, which is the dragon, uh, the toad dragon Bubelos. Uh, the toad dragon Bubelos is one of the largest motherfuckers in Warhammer fantasy. Um, he's kind of on par with the dread Saurian. Uh, I imagine he would be a big boy. Uh, but, uh, Bubelos, the toad dragon is the largest of his kind and is a nightmare creature. Um, so he would make for a very, very fun legendary Lord. Um, and, uh, the other option is Epidemius. Uh, Epidemius rides on a literal throne. Uh, he's carried on a palanquin of Nurgle and Epidemius is the, uh, he is the Herald legendary character for Nurgle. So just like you have, uh, you know, we talked about yesterday, the blue scribes being kind of like the super, um, Herald version of, uh, of, of a Herald of Zinch. Um, Epidemius is the super version of a Herald of Nurgle. And he is a very fat and obese and nasty uh, one-headed plague bearer, uh, Herald of Nurgle, who rides on a palanquin, and he is the tally master. So his job is that he literally rides around on his throne, keeping track of all the different diseases that are taking place around the world, uh, most notably on battlefields. So when he attends a battle, he is constantly taking notes about all of the diseases that are present on the battlefield and the effects they're having on people. And he's constantly counting and making notes. And his, what's notable about him is that he is the most surly of Nurgle's demons. Um, in fantasy, he is not a funny guy, um, where a lot of the other Nurgle characters are jolly and like giggling and laughing and having a great time. Um, he is not, he is all business. 
Uh, tallying Nurgle's diseases is a full-time job. It is very, very difficult and time-consuming, and he doesn't fuck around. Uh, his Nurglings are even said to be extremely quiet because if they make too much noise, he kills them. He just squashes them. So his Nurgle, his Nurglings are said to almost be like depressed and very like fearful and quiet because they fear Epidemius's wrath. And he is, uh, he is a scowling, uh, angry demon. Uh, which is kind of unusual uh, for Nurgle's lot. But uh, I think a lot of fun could be had with him. He's a pretty powerful caster uh, in his own right. Um, and uh, his big thing is he buffs the living fuck out of Plague Bearers. He was, if you could get him going in tabletop, he was terrifying. Because basically the more the more kills that um, the, the demons of Nurgle were able to unleash, the more diseases that he tallied, the more he like generates a uh, power of plague and draws the winds of magic to himself and earns grandfather's uh, love and appreciation, which leads to um, just incredible amounts of power. And it makes the plague bearers stronger and stronger and stronger until they just become unstoppable. Uh, so honestly having him on the battlefield as a character who is able to just, um, I would probably have him, uh, have that, uh, like kind of the mortis engine rule, um, or actually more accurately a, um, chaos war shrine where he has a or area of effect. And anytime someone, uh, dies within an area of effect, he builds up a tally. And as he builds up more tallies, he gives map wide buffs to all, uh, it could just be plague bearers. Uh, it might also just be allies. Um, but if he got going, he should be a nightmare character. Uh, cause what I would do to really make him separate from the war shrine is not only are his buffs significantly better than the war shrine buffs, but he applies them map wide instead of only like in a 35 or 55 meter radius. Um, which could make him truly terrifying. So those, I think, are your only really two realistic options for Thrones of Decay is either Tomicon or Epidemius. There are a ridiculous amount of other Nurgle characters, but those are the two that I'm expecting. Uh, as for a uh, legendary hero, uh, if it ends up being a Nurgle character, if if we get Tarmacon, it's going to be Kazrik the Befouled. It has to be Kazrik the Befouled. Uh, Kazrik is uh, Tarmacon's lieutenant, um, one of his generals, and he was a he's the leader of the Rot Knights. So he is a really big, scary, powerful um, Nurgle uh, warrior of chaos that rides on this horrible, diseased uh, lizard-like creature called a rot beast, which is a unique mount to Nurgle and is very super scary and awful, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. Uh, if it's not Tarmacon, which I think it is, to be honest, um, if it's Epidemius, uh, I feel like, I feel like, I don't know, like I, I still would go for Kazrik. Um, I'm not really sure who else I would really peg for a legendary hero slot, to be honest, for Nurgle. Um, so I don't think I'm going to bother, uh, as for the new units, uh, because I'm feeling pretty confident in Starmacon, uh, I think we're going to get rot beast knights to me. That feels like an easy, easy ad. Uh, you got skull crushers being the ultimate cornate cavalry. You've got the, uh, the doom knights being the ultimate zinch cavalry on discs. So I think that the rot beast knights are going to be the ultimate Nurgle cavalry. Uh, available to both Mono God Nurgle and Warriors of Chaos, and they will be probably super badass. Poison attacks, very, very tanky. Mark of Nurgle, some other nasty disease effect, and just super bitchin', as one might say. Um, Pestigors, I think Pestigors would be a great second unit, uh, kind of continuing the thread we talked about yesterday with the Zongors, available to both the Beastmen and Mono God Nurgle. Um, uh, an elite unit that brings a lot of tankiness to the board. Maybe they wield, um, you know, big, great weapons, uh, or, and have like weird disease effects. Like I could see like a really cool effect where they're, they have like a constant rust effect on the people around them. So they cause maybe like melee attack and armor to be reduced as people's weapons and armor rust. If they get too close, uh, that could be kind of a cool effect, but you know, poison attacks, all that stuff, uh, for the final unit. Hmm. Kind of a tricky one. Hmm. There was actually a Nurgle chariot back in the storm of chaos. The Nurgle chariot. Uh, hold on. I've actually grabbed my 
Storm of Chaos book over here, if I can find it. There it is. Um, I, I believe it's in this book. Uh, I, I think that could make for a really fun new unit. Um, cause they, they had all the different, uh, uh, yes. The, the chariots of Nurgle, uh, cause there, there were things, well, I mean, they could do plague riders, which plague riders were, um, uh, rode around on, um, plague bears mounted on demon beasts of Nurgle. But I feel like plague rot, uh, the, the, the rot beast knights kind of already cover that. And we also have pox riders of Nurgle. So I feel like that's already covered. So I would do a chariot of Nurgle, which chariots of Nurgle are said to be, um, two plague bearers that are pulled by demon beasts of Nurgle. So perhaps it could be two plague bearers pulled on a, pulled on a chariot, pulled by uh, plague toads or a rot beast. Um, but that'd be something different Could give. It could give like a, a demon chariot, uh, to mono God Nurgle, um, which could be uh, pretty fun and be, you know, have a lot of like, uh, different, uh, weird effects. I'm, I'm trying to see, did it come? What I'm trying to see if it came with any unique abilities, uh, compared to the, uh, compared to the, um, other stuff. Uh, let's see. Ah, just poison attacks, cloud of flies. Oh, it, oh, oh, it was a large target. So it was actually big. So it was a, it, they, it was a big fat chariot. Um, cool. So that could be really fun. More of kind of a monstrous chariot. Um, but, uh, so maybe like Nurgle's answer to the Gorby's chariot could be a way to think of it. But anyway, uh, so I think that's it for Nurgle. Uh, moving on to the empire, uh, for the empire, I am please let Boris Toddbringer just be made playable. Like I don't, I don't even need it to be Mindheim themed. Um, I will say if it's Tarmacon, then it's probably Elspeth von Draken. Um, Elspeth von Draken just feels like the obvious choice. Uh, she was the big and she was the, if Tarmacon was the protagonist, then Elspeth von Draken was the antagonist. Uh, she was the really big, bad, um, empire character. She is an extremely powerful, uh, wizard Lord that rides a Carmine dragon, which is a death dragon that literally shoots purple sun lasers out of its mouth because forge world had no fucking idea how to write balance rules. Like I said, great lore, great minis forge world had some of the most ass rules design you'll ever see in your life. Like the rules were garbage. Uh, they were so terrible. Um, so definitely do not, uh, hopefully that would need to be, uh, really, 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 really toned down. Um, but, uh, beyond that, uh, I, I think she would make for a great lo legendary Lord. A lot of people like her. Um, it also could probably give Balthazar Gelt an excuse to move, uh, somewhere else because she's from Nuln. So I almost feel like she would be slightly better off. I mean, granted they could send Elspeth von Draken away as well. Um, you know, if Tarmacon starts in one part of the world, they could say that Elspeth like has heard the prophecy of the, uh, of the, uh, the chaos, uh, the throne of chaos, and she has gone out to stop him. So she's left Nuln behind and has led, uh, you know, she's, she's been told by the elector countess, uh, Emmanuel von Liebwitz to, um, march out and stop Tarmacon before his invasion begins. So she goes out and fights him and Balthazar Gelt stays in, stays in Sunland. Um, but, uh, so that would work fine. But, uh, as far as what would come with her, um, I would say wizard Lords, uh, I think, I think wizard Lords would be the obvious new Lord choice. Um, the only hero we're missing for the empire are the master engineers uh, or just, I just Imperial engineer, I guess. Um, so engineer heroes, please give us engineer heroes, uh, give them the unique, don't give them a horse, give them the clockwork horse from tabletop. The clockwork horse is such a badass design. Uh, it would be really, really cool to see where it's just like constantly clicking and clanking. It's got like steam coming out of it and stuff, uh, would be super badass. Uh, but you know, give him a gun. May maybe he gets like a Hawkland long rifle. Um, so he's like a very long range sniper character. It could be a lot of really fun. He buffs all of your different ranged units. Um, but I think he would be a very, very awesome hero to have added. Um, as far as a potential legendary hero, Ludwig Schwartzhelm. If you're going to do the empire for the love of God, if you're going to do an empire hero, Ludwig Schwartzhelm, the big banner, the glorious beard, the badass uh, weapons and armor. He is, he is, he is one of my favorite empire characters. Please give us Ludwig Schwartzhelm. Uh, if, if the empire gets the character, 
Uh, so beyond that, we have uh, for units. Mm, for units, uh, the the only obvious one is the Celestial Hurricanum. Uh, the Celestial Hurricanum is the Lore of Heavens version of the Luminarch of Hish, but instead of being a, a giant laser beam, it, it's like a it's like the the, the planetary orrery. So it's got like all the little planets revolving around each other and stuff, and it unleashes the powers of the heavens. So it can call down comets, lightning bolts, rain, um, you know, blasts of wind and stuff. So I would give it a series of bound spells. I would probably give it like a one cast use of comet. Uh, and like two or three uses of Urian's Thunderbolt, very similar to the, it's very, very similar to be honest to the whooshing war compass of Grand Cathay. Uh, however, where the Luminarch of Hish provides defensive buffs, being that it provides like a small ward safe to nearby units, um, the, 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 uh, Celestial Hurricane kind of does the opposite. It provides, um, offensive buffs to like melee units. So it should buff like melee attack. It makes units more accurate as like the heavens guides their strikes, you know, with that little bit of, uh, it basically provides just a little hint of precognition to people that are standing close enough to it. Uh, so it allows them to aim more carefully or like know what their opponents are going to do just a little bit enough that they can react to it. Um, so I think that would be super duper fun. Um, so beyond that, um, Really, from that point forward, uh, a new knightly order, I think, would be very well received. So maybe the Knight's Panther or Knights of the White Wolf. Uh, I would probably, I think Knights of the White Wolf would do better with a Middenheim-themed DLC or a Midland-themed DLC, uh, which I do think we will get one day, um, though I don't think this is the D DLC we're going to get it. I, th I think this is going to be um, Elspeth, not Middenheim. Um, though it could be Mindheim, you know, it, it could be that the legendary Lord is our Ulrich, um, uh, Emir Valgir, and he's showing up with a bunch of Mindheim units and that the throne of decay is the city of Mindheim itself, uh, maybe being attacked by Epidemius, totally possible. Um, so I think the celestial hurricane we're getting regardless. I think the engineer hero is the best option regardless. Um, if it's a Mindheim themed DLC, I would probably like to see warrior priest of Ulrich, um, and or Grand Masters, uh, so like a Grand Master Lord. Uh, Grand Masters are the heads of the Knightly Orders. Uh, so seeing like, so like where the Empire General is more about support buffs and has like kind of an eh melee profile, uh, but can like ride a griffin and provide a lot of different roles on the battlefield. Uh, uh, Grand Master, their highest, like they would, their highest tier amount would either be a demi griff or a griffin, but they should be able to ride a demi griff. And they should be very heavily armored, super badass combat stats. You know, none of that, none of that middling combat stats. No, we're talking plate, you know, full plate, um, and just a badass in melee, but not don't provide nearly as good of like general support. Uh, are also significantly more expensive to field, um, and are really only able to buff like other knight units. They're they aren't really able to do much for um your like state troops. Um, so beyond that, I would say, uh, if, okay. So Elspeth von Draken, wizard Lords, master engineer hero, and, um, celestial hurricanum, uh, Knights Panther, I think would make the most sense. So Knights Panther knightly order, uh, because if anybody would ride out to go face the forces of Tarmacon, um, journey out to face the forces of chaos, uh, regardless of how far afield it's the Knights Panther. They live for that shit. And then the last unit, um, really could be anything. Uh, I think Hawkland long rifles would be really badass. Um, like a, a unit of sniper range. So kind of not like Giselles, but kind of like Giselles, you know, like I, I don't know if you've ever seen a Hawkland long rifle, but they're big guns. Uh, so seeing like these humans with like really, really, really big guns from far away, just being like, papa. um, I also could go for foot knights. Um, like the, uh, foot, foot Reichsguard could be really, really cool. So some kind of elite foot soldier that are not great swords, um, but maybe have a more defensive leaning could be fun. Um, really, uh, if, if they're not eventually going to do, uh, Mindheim, which would make me super sad. Cause I really feel like they could have their own DLC. Um, then white wolves of Ulrich, uh, the, 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 the nightly order would be 
really nice. So they're they're knights that don't wear helmets. They're they all they just don't wear helmets. It's against their uh, their strictures. So they don't wear helmets. They have wolf pelts and they carry cavalry hammers. So they have big two handed hammers. That they're going around going and smashing people. So like super heavy armor piercing. Uh, whereas knights panther uh, wear very elaborate helmets. Um, and have like lances and shields and they're more like elite, elite cavalry, uh, with probably much more of an anti-large focus. Like they're very big on taking on monsters and chaos creatures and they love hunting down big baddies. Uh, so I, I, I think knights with uh, more of an anti-large leaning could be fun. Um, that still have like really, really solid high melee attack, melee defense armor, um, reasonable speed. Uh, but have like enough numbers where they're significantly different from demigriffs with halberds, uh, especially because they still have shields, so they're better against missile weapons. Um, so yeah, uh, if it ends up being Mindheim, then probably our Ulrich legendary lord uh, bring out and he brings out like you know the the instead of a warrior priest of Sigmar, we get warrior priest of Ulrich, where he has like uh, Ulrichan prayers um, for a hero, either the warrior priest of Ulrich or the uh, the engineer. And for the Lord for that DLC, maybe Grand Masters, legendary hero for the Empire, regardless of who they end up going with, uh, give me, give me um, Ludwig Schwartzelm. Boris Todd, Toddbringer finally made playable would be great, please. And uh, then Celestial Hurricanum, Knights Panther, uh, and or White Wolves of Ulrich, and then maybe like Hawkland Long Rifle, uh, Hawkland Long. Ha- Hockland long rifle infantry. So yeah, that's going to be it for my predictions uh, on the thrones of decay. Please let me know what you think down below. Is there anything that I missed that you're like, Oh, so how could you not have talked about this? Or is there anything that you think was uh, a terrible call? Like you, you think I'm completely off base. Do you agree with everything I said? Let me know. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. And I will be back tomorrow where we talk about uh patch 6.0, where we know virtually nothing other than Slanesh. So I'll see you guys then uh, for that one, which is going to be a real tinfoil hat, hattie. And uh, yeah, take care.